Hello everyone, welcome at our core protocol sync. We'll share updates from the whole core protocol team from last week and our immediate plans. Shamil, do you want to share updates first? Sure. One moment. Last week, uh, I finished code cleanup and started adding new uh, features to the next version of the DSM. Um, basically, I added an ounce piece uh, feature to the um, uh, farmers and to, to nodes and guest piece providers feature to the DSM participants. Uh, this will enable to uh, get pieces from, uh, from the source, from nodes currently, uh, for farmers and to enable our new version of plotting. I changed the data um, a publication from Gossip Sub Protocol to Kademlia version. Uh, I added some, um, some support for pr provider storing for our uh, custom data store in the networking crate and added just an example to um, uh, work with this new code. Um, also, also, we discussed with Nazar our integration point, and it will be highly likely that we will have uh, plot new plotting this week, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I, I will use later this week our this new new integration code to, to test uh, this new pieces announcement. Uh, during this week, uh, my my current task will be to support pulling pieces from nodes using custom uh, request response protocol that I'm going to do first. Also, uh, I will probably improve our custom data store to uh, for the networking create to support data providers absolution and removing. I think I will do this also this week. I, I will have time for this. That's it. Okay, thanks, Shamil. Um, any blockers except integration point? No, this is a major one, and I I, I want to highly encourage you to prioritize this feature in your work. Of course. Any other questions to Shamil? All right. Um, Ivan, you didn't have any updates, right? This time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, Lucien, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, last week I have like uh, one major period which is about the fork handling, the last part. Um, there are like a lot of like details in there. Um, I like spent a few days to working with those details and adding some tests. So I, I won't like dive into this. Like if you're interested, please like uh, get to take a look at this PR and there are the main changes like uh, listed in the description. They also in as a PR like uh, discovered by Nazar, which is about um, like flow about the like uh, tags in the unsigned extrinsic like uh, about signing the bundle. Um, there's a edge case that some extrinsic may maybe like they will never match. So yeah, it is already fixed. Yeah, thanks, Nila. Yeah. That's all updates on the code protocol. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, explain it a little bit more clearly. There was basically um, there there is a mechanism in the substrate where you can uh, have dependency between transaction to transaction pool. And there was a case where you may have a dependency which will never like appear in transaction, so your transaction will be stuck um, and not included ever. Okay, um, Daria, what do you have to share today? Um, so last week I have been working on the DSN V1, well, maybe we can call it spec, we can call it documentation. And uh, then on Friday I have expanded it quite a lot. Uh, but at this point, I feel like, uh, well, with my limited experience in the area, I've reached the writer's block about what I can write about it on my own. 
So I'm not sure if I should spend any more time on it or I should switch to V2 or we should maybe have another meeting, well, another A meeting with like you and Shamel and see what else is missing there. But I'm pretty sure I cannot contribute to that on my own anymore. Um, then on the consensus uh, V2 spec, uh, we have met uh, with you and Jeremiah and uh, the, I'm very eager to contribute to that, but uh, Jeremiah has to make uh, some more of his notes still. And so I am fiddling with the polynomial commitments mass, trying to prepare sort of a report on what are the schemes others are using and how can we apply it to our, which one we can choose. So I'm still uh, trying to resolve that. So for, okay. yeah, so I'm not sure what's the, the DSN uh, stuff is like the biggest question for now, what, where we should in my, proceed in my from opinion, there. Um, I don't think it's really valuable to, to make the V1 spec perfect because it's all going to get, a lot of that's going to get deprecated. And um, I think it would probably be worth focusing on V2 at this stage. Mm -hmm. True, but I wanted to make we one sort of uh, at least the um, the skeleton of it to just translate it to V2. And if there are some important things or important sections missing or the style of writing should be completely different and the level of detail, um, I don't have an answer. <coughs> Sorry, don't have answers to that for now. I don't think I checked latest um, edits uh, after the previous review. But I yeah, I think I have submitted them either Friday or Saturday. So maybe you should look at that. Um, I also didn't find any good sort of other blockchains documentation on this stuff that I could follow um because uh, either they were very wordy with not a lot of details or just the structs and the networking crates was not much words so um quite stuck here so um yeah most blockchains just have a very basic gossip protocol that just re-implements whatever bitcoin or ethereum use so um, i know several yeah. examples of this structure, one of this several DTP, DP2P protocols, the another one would be a disk five protocol from Ethereum too. Okay. Yeah, maybe if you could uh, shoot them my way, I would look at them. Yes, I will DM you. Thanks. And Bitcoin protocol is also quite simple, and they have like all of the messages uh, described, and from that it's relatively obvious how to use it, um, and they have like everything down to bytes, I believe, um, specified, like what the network layer looks like. They're not using like uh, Lipertica or anything complex, mm -hmm. encrypted and stuff. Um, in our case, it's of course much more complex, so probably not feasible to describe everything we have in there. Yeah, I think this goes back to the confusion over the requirements here. I was really just looking more for an architecture document. I mistakenly used the word spec and now we're trying to turn it into a spec, which was never really the goal. So that's why I feel like maybe we shouldn't um, dive too deeply into this, but until until we actually finalize what that protocol is going to look like, because it's still still in flux right now. OK, so should I kind of hold it for now? Like I will look at the stuff that Shamil and Nazar says it, and see whether I get an inspiration for like to make it some more, and then we get back to it later. Yeah, I haven't looked at it yet, Daria, um, but that would be my my intuition right now, um, okay. and to focus yeah. on the KZG stuff uh, or the the polynomial erasure coding schemes right now. Okay. Okay, um, with that, let me share. A couple screen. other, sorry, question, uh, things on the research front while we're on that. 
Um, I'm actually speaking to uh, Kelly from Supernational later today. Um, uh, so we might be doing some, getting some feedback from them. They worked with Filecoin uh, on a lot of their POR optimizations and um, I think they've worked with the Chia, Chia folks a bit as well. Um, so there'll be some hopefully good feedback on the V2 consensus and potential um, implementation choices um, that they can comment on and they can always help us out with uh, optimizing some of the primitives uh, if there's any that are that are big bottlenecks um, or something else you'd said Daria about oh yeah consensus v2 yes I have some stuff I need to talk with uh, about uh, with Nazar about um, we're gonna have one-on-one -on -one after this uh, and then hopefully I'll be able to make uh, finalize those updates uh, today. Uh, but I did spend the better part of the weekend working on that. It's just not, I didn't put it in the document yet because it was still being revised. Okay. Okay, that's it on my side. Sorry. Yeah, let me know when you would want me to look at that. All right, you should be able to see this. Um, since we have spent just 15 minutes, I think I can go into a bit more detail on the consensus implementation so everyone is on the same page. Um, this was a small pull request, nothing really fancy. Um, I think I mentioned it can previously. You zoom in uh, just a little bit, Nazar, please. Thanks. Um, this is a piece cache on the node side. Uh, we can reuse data structure later. Uh, we basically need this to request pieces from the node initially and then later when we have dsn integration to return it from uh, recent pieces from this cache um, that was that's something that was merged uh, what wasn't merged is uh, this big branch i have um, there is a lot of stuff here um, basically we are implementing um, slightly a different version of version two consensus it is simplified uh, with some of the things just having placeholders instead of final implementation. Um, one of the concepts we have is sector ID. And I, I'm not really sure about the API right now, uh, but the way I put it together uh, so far is that we have this data structure and then we can use that um, to derive things like this index, uh, what we need to sync when we create a sector. And then we can also derive local challenge for that sector. Um, and that is in contrast to the subspace uh, solving crate we had before. And actually because underlying primitives are difficult and complex and big, uh, but the protocol itself is actually simpler uh, the way it works. You don't have like all of these mappings, databases and, and recommitments. So I think we may move all of those things into subspace uh, core primitives. And in many cases, just as methods uh, here, I'm just like curious, what is your opinion? Uh, I guess if functions are standalone, it's easier to find them. Uh, but this grouping also kind of makes sense. Um, so if any of you have any opinion about this, um, let me know, I guess, on, on Slack uh, later. And we can discuss it. Um, there are some functions added separately, some methods added here. Um, and there is also a function here that um, defines what the sector size should be. And I was concerned initially about the fact that uh, space L is size in bits, uh, while our um, data structures are usually in bytes. However, there is one um, coincidence. Um, if space L is at least three, that means um, it will be at least two to the power of three, which is eight, which is exactly one byte. So as long as this is more than three or equal to three, uh, we will never have to deal with partial uh, bytes. Um, so this thing will basically panic uh, if you don't have uh, at least three here. Um, I think that's a reasonable assumption. Initial value will be something like 20, uh, final maybe like 26. So three is really, really low. It shouldn't be ever a problem. Um, and on the same note, um, we may have a uh, plot sector size outputted from here, which is actually not a multiple of pieces, potentially. 
But again, if space L is uh, big enough, uh, it will never ever be a problem. So if you have, let's say, 32 kilobytes for the P size, then this needs to be at least 16, and then we don't have this problem. So either way, um, it doesn't seem to be a really a practical issue, uh, but something I was concerned initially and uh, was proven to be no, non-issue. As our, about the uh, the restructuring, the uh, subspace solve crate into the primitives, I think uh, that makes sense. Um, I would just say we should probably wait until the third milestone uh, until we until we do any major restructuring of the repository, just because uh, we might just end up reverting it if if we find some issues here. This is an experiment still, so I would say we, maybe we just shouldn't worry too much about optimizing the implementation until we've actually run like an end to end experiment and make sure that this is what we want. Well, I'm adding like primitives into two spaces, uh, two places, but I'm not moving anything yet. Um, and most of those things we have in subspace solving will actually be deleted. Um, so once we clear, uh, clean things up, um, maybe there will be a lot to move. Um, we'll see. Another thing I had never dealt with is uh, create bitback, which basically um, offers a lot of different wrapper data structures and APIs to work on bit level instead of byte level with data. Uh, with data. So you can like iterate over bits, you can uh, slice things in the middle of the byte uh, you can do all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, that's something we are using. Another thing is uh, memory mapped files. There is this crate which offers cross-platform support, which basically allows you to open a file and then create a memory mapping for it. So for you, it looks like uh, a slice of memory, which can be read-only or mutable. Um, but be behind that slice is actually the full file. So you can like work with the file as with it simple slice of memory, uh, which in many cases is more efficient and is actually very convenient in some uh, places. I will show you later. Last thing is uh, because we are using this um, memory mapped files, um, there is actually an implicit assumption that for big enough plot, uh, we will need 64-bit integers for offsets. Um, however, we may potentially compile this crate to 32-bit platform. Uh, in which case we'll not be able to reach to some of the offsets uh, because uh, when we are working with memory, we are working with U size, which can be 32 or 64 bit or 16 or whatever. Um, but with file system, we usually work with U64 directly. Um, so I added static assertions crate uh, that basically refuses to compile on 32 bit platform. Uh, that's like Raspberry Pi 2 and older or like 20 years old CPUs. Um, so it's not really a practical concern, I don't think. Um, if someone wants to do uh, something on 32-bit platform, they can create a custom farmer, basically. Um, so those are some notable uh, dependencies. And I think I can walk you through a um, new abstraction. I'm currently building it in a separate file called single disk plot, uh, separately from the rest. Uh, it's not like actually used right now, but I'm still building it. So here we have, just like before, identity for a particular plot. This plot will contain multiple sectors, each of which contains uh, multiple pieces. Um, and then we also have uh, some metadata for it. We will remember again what chain we are on, what was the identity when we created it, and how much space was allocated, stuff like that. Uh, we also have first sector index uh, because we can reuse the same identity for multiple different plots, uh, but we need to make sure to use uh, different sector index such that they will be like distinct sectors and not the same when we count from zero. So when we create multiple plots on different disks, we will make sure that the offset is big enough uh, to not overlap. Uh, so that's another thing we are re remembering here. Um, and then we have the data structure which uh, encapsulates this plot. And inside of it, uh, we are doing some math to figure out how many of those sectors we can store. and um, also, again, here assertion that our sector is multiple of P size. If that's not the case, it will just crash right away. Uh, that's not something ever should happen. Uh, but if it does, um, there is really nothing we can do about it. And after we re uh, recover metadata and ensure it's correct, we open metadata file. Uh, this is one binary file. It has a prefix, which will store um, basically how many um, sectors we are storing there. That's like the only 
useful number we have there. We also have like a version. And then for every uh, particular sector, we will store in metadata about its expiration. So we'll know when we need to uh, update that sector or like replot it. Um, again, if it's a new, um, like if you're just creating this file, uh, then we'll pre-allocate it and we'll write the header, uh, which says version zero and we have no sectors actually plot plotted yet. Um, otherwise we'll open the file, uh, metadata file we have uh, on disk and we will create a memory mapped uh, file out of that. And um, there are actually two things. So one will be created um, from the very beginning of that binary file. So like the, the header of the file, basically, uh, that will contain this uh, count of how many sectors we've plotted. Uh, so we don't try to reach out to the memory that was allocated, but not actually plotted yet. Um, and with that offset, we are uh, having the rest, which is uh, metadata for each, each sector, which has expiration in it. Once we have that, we can open the file, uh, which is just sectors concatenated one after another, big uh, flat binary file. Uh, we also pre-allocate that file. We uh, advise the operating system that we'll be doing random access there. So no need to cache anything and use extra memory. And we create memory mapping for that as well. Uh, this is the thing that we can uh, use basically as uh, mutable memory slice. Uh, it will be reference to that. Um, and after that, we create two background threads. Uh, the first one is for plotting. It only supports uh, the initial plotting right now. So because we have these memory mapped uh, files, we can basically take the first, um, uh, we, can, we can take the plot and we can chunk it into uh, plot sizes, uh, sector sizes. Um, and then we can take metadata, slice it into metadata sizes, and then we can just zip it um, and we can iterate uh, over that uh, uh, tuple of three things. And then for every sector, we'll basically create a sector ID. Uh, we'll update the protocol information that we have so we can all we can always reference to the latest uh, uh, number of archived sectors that, that there is. Because if you're plotting for like three hours, there might be some sectors already plotted. So if you reference the old uh, height, then our expiration will be basically less than it could be. Um, after that, uh, we uh, retrieve and uh, compute what is the current uh, segment actually is. This is something we can just add to metadata. I decided to not update the data structure yet. And then we calculate expiration. And with that, we can basically uh, iterate over our sector. This is a memory, uh, basically bytes, but we iterate it um, as over uh, pieces. And for every piece, we need to uh, plot it. So we take sector ID and derive the piece index. This is the piece that we need to retrieve uh, from the DSN uh, in the future. Um, and then for that piece, um, we will actually um, derive a commitment that's necessary for encoding uh, in this simple version. And then this create for a uh, bit back, which allows us to iterate over bits. So we uh, create kind of slice of bits uh, in a way, and then we chunk it into um, currently 20 bits uh, at a time. And then we uh, do that in parallel. We basically um, take those bits and we derive uh, our basically one-time pad for the chunting index uh, in the piece. And then we uh, XOR it together. Um, yeah, once we have that, we can basically write that uh, encoded piece into the uh, location in the sector that corresponds to it. And then we can write the metadata for the whole sector once we're done with all of the pieces. And we can update the header uh, metadata and write it to that memory mapped piece of file um, with the updated sector count. So we know that that sector is done. We can actually start using it for farming. Any questions about this part? Does it make sense at least on the high level? Why did you choose uh, memory mapping? Uh, did you try to optimize something? Um, if you are not using memory mapping, uh, it becomes tricky to reference different bits. And I'll probably have to write, in that case, some kind of library that allows me to address it, right? However, if you are using memory mapping, we can just use one method and we, we have bits already. Um, and also, it's, it's kind of common to use uh, memory mapping in databases. And we kind of have a database. Um, 
So it's so, not a per performance uh, solution. I think it also will impact performance. Yes, um, it should it should increase it, but, but you it, yeah. you picked it not because of that reason. Yeah, I was just like thinking upfront, like what would be the API uh, that would be nice to work with and performant. And I just thought about memory mapped files, and I read some about them. Uh, it seems like like a good fit in this particular case. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's our plotting. Um, it's all wrapped in the try catch. Uh, no, just try. Uh, so we can get a result, and that result, if it has an error, we will send it uh, over the channel, and that channel will be. Um, on the other side of that channel is in background task. So just like uh, before, um, in the, um, I don't remember what kind of single disk plot. No, there was something different before. Basically we have this uh, run method at the end and we will be waiting for errors. So you can like await on this. And even though we have uh, threads instead of tasks, we can still wait and exit uh, when the, uh, an error happens. Um, and in the end, we wrap our uh, plotting task in the uh, in the state structure. So when we do actually shut down the whole application, we'll wait for that task to finish, um, which it will because it has um, where is it? Uh, it has this check. When things is uh, shutting down, it will um, exit from here. So that's about plotting. Uh, now to farming. Farming is again the same kind of uh, background thread. Uh, same uh, characteristics. Um, here we subscribe to notifications uh, from the node, just like before our RPC. And for every slot, we'll try to solve. Um, here we actually have another memory mapped uh, slice, but this, this time readable, uh, not read-write. And we'll take the same uh, file, uh, plot file, and we will limit ourselves to just the uh, piece of memory that was already plotted. That's why we have that header uh, metadata. Uh, we can calculate sector size, multiply by the size of one sector, and we have this basically piece of memory that we can chunk and not worry about uh, stepping onto something that wasn't plotted yet. Um, and then basically for every single sector, uh, we are deriving uh, the sector ID uh, from that local challenge, from that audit index, and then we create, um, we basically extract uh, a single chunk that is 20 bits at a specific offset uh, at audit index that we need to verify. And then we expand it um, with, the, with the hash function. So we have uh, the same size as the solution range um, and local challenge. And once we have that, we, we basically can uh, already compute whether it's uh, within solution range or not. Uh, it's quite simple comparing to the databases we had before. Uh, in here, we just like read the offset and we're done. Um, there is no data structure for actually sending the solution yet. Uh, that's something that will be done with verification on the node side, but the whole workflow is basically here. Um, and this is kind of close to what it will look eventually. I hope you can kind of appreciate the simplicity of the workflow comparing to how many different moving parts we had before. Um, there will be a big moving part uh, at the top here in plotting. Uh, after initial plotting, we will have replotting. It will basically have like a timer that waits for a certain number of uh, segments to be archived. And then when some of the uh, segments, uh, sectors we, we have plotted needs to be updated, uh, it will be updated. Uh, but that's like the only major thing that's left here. Um, otherwise, it's just one file. I think eventually we will move these threads into separate modules or uh, functions and it will be even nicer. Uh, but I was trying to prototype it um, in one place so far. On, on that note about the sector expiry, um, that's another thing that we can save for the final milestone as well. We can just assume static sectors for the first two milestones. Those are okay. Okay, that that makes it simpler. So for the okay, so. Oh, when you're done, I will ask a question. No, go ahead. Um, for the, um, I saw you made a continuous segment indexing across disks. Is that where we're going with, or is it something that a user will be able to specify whether they want one identity or across multiple disks, 
or uh, anything on the antiquer disk? Or, uh... Uh, technically, we don't need um, multiple identities. We might have it. Uh, we may may not. Um, if we have it, uh, there is a question of like, if someone in, is connecting to you, um, you will probably have to prove to them that like you're you're storing something. Like if you want to announce I'm storing this sector, you need to prove to them that you are actually supposed to store it. Let's say, and then it is tied to your plot uh, identity. Mm -hmm. Whether we want to tie that plot identity to the network identity, I don't know. Um, we don't technically have to do that. Uh, we might, so we'll see. Uh, so in the best case, we'll have one network identity and one plot identity. Uh, in the worst case, we'll have as many network and uh, plot identities as we have disks, which is in simple case, still one, but in some cases it will be like three. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, there, we, we assume that there will be just one for everything. Uh, okay. And we just have this non-overlapping regions for the sector index. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I just checked that in the spec, I have written that there is one identity per disk, so I can rewrite it that it's just one. Identity. Yeah, I don't. I think that's like okay. an implementation detail. We don't need to talk about disks in the spec. It's kind of irrelevant. Okay, so I will just say for the pledged space, allocate a plot. And yeah, exactly. Just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Did you run plotting and farming simultaneously? Do you I work? didn't run it at all. Oh, okay. I'm asking because since you're working with the same file, I'm worrying about exclusive access problems to the same file because memory mapped file is a kernel object. It could have some context with that. Yeah, um, I was looking into that. Um, the worst thing I see happening right now is we will be, we happen to solve on something which is being uh, replotted right now. And we are like reading partially one thing, partially yes. another thing. The worst exactly. thing that will happen in that case, our solution will be invalid. Uh, but that's about it. Um, are, are we okay with this? I think it's okay. We can potentially deal with it later, uh, but that's really not a big problem. Um, the probability is pretty low. Yeah. The, the plot is uh, built in such a way that it is um, almost written once and like really rarely updated in really random locations. Um, so probability that you win and you hit that particular location when it is replotted, like it's fairly low. It, it will happen uh, likely in some edge cases, but I don't think it is a problem. It will not like cause memory issues or like protocol issues. Um, we, we can deal with it okay, if you really you. want, like put some kind of mutex or something, but I'm not sure it's necessary. Okay, any other questions? I noticed that you used a little endian and big endian in the same file, basically. Is it intentional? Uh, where exactly? Okay, let it lead to the PR then. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure um, I remember the exact file. We were using, uh, okay, so most of the modern platforms, including x86 and ARM, are Little Endian. So, if you are using Little Endian, it will be basically native machine code. That's why Little Endian is basically the default almost everywhere. However, we had databases before um, where we used keys uh, as bytes that need to be sorted. And because of that sorting property, we were using big endian in that particular case. I think most of those uh, cases will disappear uh, because we will not have those kinds of databases anymore. So that's why you might see in the same file two different uh, versions. The old one is probably just like I see that we will remove. I wasn't removing this pull request anything. I just want to add it first, then like remove a big chunk and then like modify slightly. Uh, so it is it is a little bit reviewable. Um, that's why, for instance, this, um, where is it? Function for uh, verification. Um, yeah, is within solution range two. Just didn't want to break compilation for the, the rest of the um, code base. Okay. Um, 
Another interesting thing is that for every plot before we had a different identity and thus we had different subscription for reward signatures. Um, right now I've created just a simple function uh, because identity will be the same, so we don't need to run multiple of those. Um, small difference uh, in the farming process again. Um, otherwise, I don't think there is uh, much to look here. Um, expect more uh, development here and then pull requests. Okay. Um, anything else uh, we would like to discuss? All right. Thanks, everyone, for great work. And we'll see you folks on YouTube next week.